Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to Takeo Tuesday on this beautiful May 24th. I'm John Barba, uh, and I'm broadcasting to you from a unique location. We are on the show floor of the 2022 Eastern Energy Exposition at the Mohegan Sun Casino Resort Convention Center in uh, in Uncasville, Connecticut. And uh, it's a big trade show for uh, for all of the Eastern oil dealers and energy providers. And uh, Takeo has a booth here uh, at our at the at the show, as we always do, and we're a premier premier sponsor of the event. And uh, today's show is going to come to you from from the show floor. And if uh, we get a chance, maybe a little later on, I'll turn the camera on so you can see the booth and see a little bit of the show. Uh, but we're psyched to have you here, folks. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, uh, we're gonna, there's going to be a lot of announcements going on, so 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 bear with us. Um, but anyway. Uh, Thanks for being here. We're going to have a deep dive into Takeo's residential ECM lineup. And as you can see the sign behind me, Easy ECM. Uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the different products and why they're important and what they do. And we're going to spend a little bit of time, most importantly, on what they don't do. Uh, there's no magic here. There's no figuring it out for you. There's no, hey, I, it does everything. I don't have to know anything. It's a smart pump maybe the worst name for these things that's ever been created or, or, or tagged onto something is smart pump. Don't call these things smart pumps, folks. They're not that smart. They do pretty cool things, all right? But, but thinking is not one of them. They don't do the thinking for you. They're not magic. They don't take the thinking out of circulator selection. They simply allow us to do a better job in sizing the circulator. They allow us to get the pump's performance as close as possible to the actual needs of the system and to minimize over pumping. That's the key for to ECM circulators. That's what they do. Now, before we jump into this, I just want to do a quick, uh, just a quick status check, making sure everybody can hear me. If you go to the, the section on your control panel that says chat slash questions, if you could go in there for me and type in a hi, hello, how are you? That way I know you can hear me. And that way I know that, uh, we're communicating, so hopefully, you know, with the with the with the Wi-Fi here in the convention center, I hope uh, I hope it doesn't get too crazy. Uh, and let me know if you like this venue, this format, because we can do this again for another trade show at some point as well. So cool. All right, everybody can hear. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that. And with that, we'll get going. And, and also, just as, as again, as a friendly reminder, um, we don't. I don't particularly like waiting to the end of a presentation for you folks to ask questions. If you have questions fire away all right just type them on in and i'll answer them as they come up i'll take a break every few slides and do a and do, just do a quick check on the question section so uh, if you have a question ask it and we'll try to answer it as timely as possible so excellent with all that let's get started if you have a pad of paper and a pen hand handy i would recommend taking some notes as well treat it like we're in a classroom together that way you'll get the most out of it now again a reminder if you're a first timer uh, by noon tomorrow, you'll receive a follow-up email from us that will have uh, a, a link to the recording. So you can view the recording as many times as you like. And there will also be a link to download your certificate of attendance. So that'll all come your way tomorrow by noon time. So, alrighty, let's get into this. Let's talk about uh, residential ECM circulators. And they're like, I like to consider these evolution, the evolution of the classics. Kind of like going from you know, you know, ancient man just learning to work up a walk upright to ultimately becoming the Beatles crossing Abbey Road. I mean, to me, that's the evolution of these classics. Um, when it comes to the difference between ECM and standard AC circulators, ultimately both do the same thing, right? They make the water go round and round. On a fundamental level, ECM does this while using much less electricity. That's maybe the first thing out there. They, they're, they're electrically more efficient. They use less electricity. Whereas a typical 007 may use, let's say, 30 bucks worth of electricity per year to heat, to heat your home in a standard zone system, let's say. Uh, a 007E might cut that down to as low as 8 to $10 a year. It's not earth-changing or life-changing money, but it's significantly more efficient. Um, in the bigger picture, when we start getting into some of the other types of ECM circulators, then you start to get that the potential to dial the performance in as close to the needs and demands of the system as possible. 
And if you take a leap into the Delta T world of variable speed circulators, you do have the ability for that circulator to actually match the, match the, the uh, demand of a system under design conditions, as well as adjust to the changing demand as it gets a little bit warmer out. Now, that's a, that's a unique set of circumstances, and we're going to go over that. But that's where we start to really see ECM sing and dance, okay? That's where we start to see the, the true benefit of an ECM variable speed circulator come out. I want to start out with real basics, because whether you're talking AC or ECM, pump curves matter, all right? With, with standard circulators, we have a fixed performance curve, a single fixed, perform, a fixed operating curve. You can have a steep curve, which is known as a European style curve in the heating in the, in the circulator industry, or you can have a flat style curve, as you see here, which is known as an American style curve in the circulator industry. These are important because while variable speed circulators, ECM variable speed circulators will in fact vary their speed, they still operate on curves and we have to res be respectful of them and their performance curves. So it's, a little, it's, it's the same thing, but a little bit different so we can get a, understand how they operate and what they really, really do. So we have to understand we're still dealing with, with pump curves and performance curves, and we're still dealing with system curves. Now, system curves, we've done, we've done webinars on system curves before, so I just, I'm not gonna get into the details, uh, deeply into the details of it, other than what a system curve is. It's, it's a unique hydronic slash hydraulic fingerprint of a piping system. So let's say in a residential system, you have a, a single zone. We do the math and we figure out the flow and the flow requirements for that zone under design conditions. And then we figure out you know, the pressure loss or the head loss of that zone at that flow rate under design conditions. There's a mathematical relationship between flow and head. As flow increases in a zone, the head loss increases exponentially in that same zone. So it's, head is not a flat line. Head shoots up like you see here on that operating point. Why system curves are important. They are unique for each system and each, each individual zone, or if it's a zone valve system, you have a whole collection of system curves. Um, they are unique for each system. And why they're important is because the system will operate where the system curve intersects the pump curve, right there, it has to. I have a, perform, a pump performance curve right here. Okay, the red line is my pump performance curve. The system is going to have to operate on that curve somewhere. Where on that curve is going to be the point where the system curve intersects, intersects the pump curve right here. So if I do the math on my, on my zone, and let's say I need three gallons a minute at five feet ahead for a zone pump system, that would be right here. That's where I need to be under design conditions. I need to, a circulator that can de deliver at least that. The minute I slap a circulator on that zone, it's never, ever, ever going to work here. It's going to work where the system curve intersects the pump curve. So it's really going to operate up here at, let's say, six gallons a minute at maybe nine feet ahead. Okay. Is, am I going to deliver heat? Oh, heck yes. I'll deliver all the BTUs we could ever want here. The, th the thing is going to be, instead of delivering three gallons a minute, I'm delivering six gallons a minute. If you remember your universal hydronics formula, which states that GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500, all right? If I had 30,000 BTU and a 20 degree delta T, well, then that would equal three gallons a minute, right? 20 times 500 is 10,000, 30,000 divided by 10,000. That gives me my three gallons a minute. Well, in the example we just showed you, I'm not delivering three gallons a minute. I'm giving you six gallons a minute because that's where the system curve intersects the pump curve. There will be people that say, well, heck, you can, you can deliver more BTUs that way. I don't need more BTUs under design conditions. I only need 30,000 BTUs, right? So once I deliver 30,000 BTUs, the thermostat's going to shut off. Based on what you're looking at here, folks, what's the thing that has to give? What has to give? I'm six gallons a minute is fixed, right? 30 gallons a minute or 30,000 BTUs is fixed. Type in your answer in the, in, the, in the chat section. What has to give? What has to change, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm giving you double the flow rate that we need under this, under this uh, formula. Absolutely right. You've got it. Uh, James, James has it. Absolutely right. The delta T is the thing that has to change. 
the delta t has to change the delta t will i'm giving it twice the flow i'm going to get half the delta t the very best delta t i will ever see in that system is a 10 degree delta t not a 20. so under design conditions that quote unquote coldest day of the year the water may be going out at 180 instead of coming back at 160 it's coming back at 170. yeah i got a higher average water temperature that means you'll get more btus per foot out of the baseboard or whatever yeah yeah, I know, but it doesn't matter. I only need 30,000 BTUs. My delta T is going to be 10. If I have a delta T of 10 under design conditions, what's going to happen at the boiler? Again, type that in once you know it. If it was a mod pond boiler, water's going out at 140. I want it to come back at 120. Then the boiler will condense. In this case, no. The water's going out at 140. It's coming back at 130. It won't condense, and it's going to short cycle like crazy. Both a cast iron boiler and a mod con boiler will both be short cycling like crazy. So we've kind of impacted the efficiency of the system, wouldn't you agree? All right. That's a problem. That's a problem. So that's why we care about this stuff. All right. That's why we care about pump curves and system curves. And again, here's a kind of a graphic illustration of what happens. If I need to be, let's say here, five gallons a minute at three feet ahead or seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead, I'm really going to be working up there. And that's with that's with a standard AC circulator, fixed like a 007, a 008, a 0015 standard efficiency, a Grunfoss 1558 three speed. Same thing, only different, right? They're fixed speed, they're, they're fixed speed pumps, fixed curve pumps. Now, when we think about ECM, ECM is pretty much the same with a little bit of an asterisk, asterisk because we have some control options. What we're dealing with here are control, what we call control curves or performance curves. There are fixed performance curves, meaning the circulator will work on those curves. But in order to work on those curves, it will vary its speed depending upon the application. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's, they do change speed, but they're still going to work on a fixed performance curve. And that's the part we have to, we have to understand. And that's the thing that makes these things not magic, okay? They're not magic pumps, all right? Uh, Delta P circulators in particular are curve-centric. They must operate on performance curves. Delta T we have is where the asterisk comes in. Delta T gives us some options, but Delta P is very curve-centric. And Delta P, let's define Delta T and Delta P. Delta P, if a circulator is a Delta P variable speed circulator, that means it will vary its speed in order to maintain a specific pressure differential within the system. Remember, a circulator isn't really a pump. It's really a pressure differential machine. So let's say I, if I want to make it, it's kind of the ultimate flat curve pump if we look at it that way. And you'll see some curves here in a moment. But delta P tries to maintain a specific pressure differential within a system. Delta T, a variable speed delta T circulator, tries to maintain a specific temperature difference or delta t within the system so it'll vary its speed to maintain let's say a 20 degree delta t for as much of the heating season as it can so they're a little bit different let's let's give you some illustrations here so again as delta p it's a pressure differential machine and we're trying to maintain a specific pressure differential uh, delta p circulators in the delta p mode will have two different operating modes it'll be constant pressure or proportional pressure now, constant pressure, uh, if you look at the pump curve, constant pressure will look like that. It's, it'll maintain, let's say, a fixed 10 foot ahead constant pressure within the system. Proportional pressure will actually look like that. As flow goes down, the head pressure differential created by the circulator goes down as well. So there's two different kinds. In, in North American applications, specifically zone valve applications, constant pressure is, is the most common uh, most common operating mode. How you doing, guys? Yes, some guys stopping at the booth. I'm on. I'm doing a webinar, so how you doing? <laughs> uh, uh, constant pressure, as you'll see, is the most common and probably the most beneficial operating mode for your zone valve applications. How does it know? Well, delta P in general. Imagine an, an impeller spinning around, right? And let's say I've got a zone valve job, and I've got four zone valves open the impeller is spinning against a certain amount of resistance and that's kind of translating into an amp draw. A zone valve closes. When a zone valve closes, okay, all of a sudden that impeller is spinning against more resistance and that impacts the amp draw. 
Well, that's a signal to the to the brain of the system that says, hey, I'm all of a sudden pumping against more resistance. That means I need less flow. A zone has closed. I need less flow. So what I'm going to do is just go slower, okay, to maintain that whatever constant pressure differential we're trying to maintain. Another zone closes, more resistance again, it'll slow down. Zones open, it does the exact opposite. It's feeling less resistance. Hey, all of a sudden, now I know a zone's open, I got to speed up. So that's how a delta P circulator knows to go faster or slower. It's just interpreting the resistance it's pumping against, that the impeller's spinning against. And all it knows is zone valves open or zone valves close. That's really all it can interpret, okay? People like delta P for a couple of reasons. They're less expensive than delta T circulators. I mean, quite a bit less expensive. And there are no sensors involved. There's no internal sensors. There are no external sensors. Um, delta T circulators do require strap-on sensors on the supply and return, so it can tell you the delta T on the, the supply and return of the piping. So there's a difference there. But that, that, again, one of the reasons people do tend to prefer delta P is they are less expensive. Performance isn't the same. Delta T circulators can do some cool stuff, but the, but it can be a, it can be a price issue. Uh, the performance curves, as we're going to show, the performance curves with delta P pumps are fixed. They don't move. All right. So what does that mean? That means even if you put a delta P pump on a system, the system's still going to do what the pump says. The pump's still kind of in under control because we have to work on that performance curve, like we mentioned earlier. So even if that if that performance curve is set way too high. That's where the pump's going to work, guys. It's not going to know that it's set too high. There's nothing internal that says, hey, I'm, I'm pumping too much here. I have to slow down. It's only going to work on the performance curve that you select. And that's an important, important piece to remember. All right, I'm going to take a quick look here. Any questions that we have? Let's see. Lauren, great question. I'm glad you asked that. If a pump serves just one zone, would a, a delta T pump be best? Whereas a pump serves several zones, would a DP pump be best? Really good question, Lauren, and I would put this to you. In either case, I would say a delta T pump is better. Uh, in either case, whether it's a zone valve or a zone pump application. Uh, it's a matter of degree, however. Um, in, a, in a single zone system, it, meaning if, if, if my circulator is just serving one zone, a delta P pump is not going to vary its speed. It's going to find its happy spot, and that's where it's going to operate. OK, it will not vary its speed. It won't make depending on how you program it. It might not run at full speed. If you program it, you might be able to get the performance curve as close as possible to where you need it to be. And there's a benefit to that. A delta T pump, if it's a large enough zone, a delta T pump will find its happy spot to maintain that 20 degree delta T. And as the weather changes, as it gets warmer outside, it'll slow down. As it gets colder outside, it'll speed up. It doesn't have an outdoor sensor. It's just interpreting the load based on what happens to that delta T as based on the flow rate. So in a zone pumping application, that's terrific. That's that's kind of the holy grail. It'll do the exact same thing in a zone pumping system, okay? Or in a zone valve system, excuse me. It'll do the exact same thing in a zone valve system. So I think in either case, it's better. It's just a matter of how much better, right? How much better. Sometimes the difference is like this. Sometimes the difference is like this. And sometimes the difference is like this, depending upon the size of the system. Let me know, Lauren, if that answers your question. It was kind of a non-answer answer, I guess, but no, I, it is an answer. I think a delta T pump is better in either case. It's just a matter of degree and understanding what you're dealing with. So let me let me know, Lauren, if that answered your question. That was a good one. Is that right? Let us continue. All right, I'm going to il illustrate constant pressure mode here. And let's say I have, I have this set up to give me a, a 10 degree, or I'm sorry, a 10 foot ahead constant pressure setting. So no matter what happens, this system's going to maintain a 10 foot ahead constant pressure differential. So let's say I got a, I have a zone that, let's say I need or a, a zone valve system and under design conditions, I need, let's say eight gallons a minute at, let's call it, let's call it eight foot ahead. That's what I need. So ideally I would need to be right here but I'm not gonna be right there. I'm gonna work where the system curve intersects the pump curve or the performance curve, which is right here. So I'm really at about nine gallons a minute at 10 foot ahead. That's not a horribly oversized circulator, folks. That's not bad at all. But what it's doing is it's now working on this particular pump performance curve. Now this curve out here might be the full speed at 44 watts. This particular curve 
uh, let's say that's 35 watts. Okay, so I'm using less electricity right off the bat. Now, when a zone valve closes, when a zone valve closes, all of a sudden that impeller is spinning against a little bit more resistance, right? So what's going to happen? And it takes about a nanosecond. How are you guys doing? Uh, people, uh, people think I'm talking to myself here, but really I'm talking to a worldwide audience. So they give me these weird looks, but I'm used to that anyway. Um, what's going to happen is for like a nanosecond, this is going to act like a regular circulator. So let's say I have a new zone, right? A, or one zone valve closes and the system curve is actually going to shift this way because I have fewer zones going. What's going to happen is the operation is going to go up here for like a nanosecond, like it would on a normal circulator. It's going to have a higher pressure differential. And in the time it takes for the circulator's brain to say, I don't like that, that's wrong, we got to go slower, is the time it's going to take for this to happen. Okay? It's going to look like that. So what's going to happen is we're going to work up here for like a nanosecond and bam, drop back, back down to that 10 foot ahead constant pressure. And now I'm working on that performance curve, which I don't know, let's say that's 20, that's 29 watts, just, just to take a guess, 29 watts. Next zone call closes. I'm gonna work up here for a nanosecond and then I'm gonna drop straight down and it's gonna look like so. So now I'm working on this curve and let's say that's 20 and then so on and so on. So I'm gonna be ultimately here. And that let's say that's 18 watts. So Every day of the heating season, October, January, April, I'm going to be bopping back and forth between 18 and 35 watts, and my zone, my circulator is going to just go that way. It's going to go over here to full speed, over here to minimum speed in that application. So that's how constant pressure works. Proportional pressure is a little bit different. The proportional pressure line looks like that, okay? The, 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 the pressure differential the circulator creates will drop as flow goes down, not a great application for zone valves because you don't know where your highest head zone is going to be. This application really is of European origin. And what it does is it's a, it's used when you have constant circulation and modulating thermostatic radiator valves. In most residential applications, that's where you're going to be using proportional pressure. If you don't do that kind of job, you really don't have no use for proportional pressure. But the, the function is very similar, okay? So I'm out here. Ten, uh, all zones calling nine gallons a minute, 10 foot ahead. But now what's going to happen is when that zone, when a zone valve closes, I'm going to work up here for a nanosecond, but then I'm dropping all the way down here. Again, I'm locked in to that performance curve. I have to work on the performance curve. So as zones close, I go down that way. So in a lot of cases, maybe that'll work if you pick one high enough, but it's still not the best, in, in my mind, for a zone valve application, it's really not the best solution because what if I have what if I have a zone that has to be up here for whatever reason? It's not gonna work. You know, under design conditions, I won't get enough flow. So let me know if that makes sense to you, but that's kind of the, the, the basic functionality of proportional pressure. Delta T, as we said, is different, all right? Delta T is different. It's designed for uh, to, it's designed to maintain a, your design for delta T. So if you do a system design for, for residential hydronics and you design that system to a 20 degree delta T, you can set the circulator up to maintain a 20 degree delta T. In fact, that's what it's factory set for. You put a sensor on the supply on the hottest pipe going out and a sensor on the return for the, uh, on the, you know, the common return of the system and set it for, up for a 20 degree delta T, it'll speed up and slow down in order to maintain that 20 degree delta T for as much of the heating season as it can. It's not absolute, it's not gonna always happen, but it's going to maintain a system-wide delta T for as much as it can. Depending upon the zones, you may have a 20 degree delta T in one zone, you may have an 18 degree delta T in another, and it's, it's, it's gonna, zone by zone, it'll vary a little bit, but the thing is the water going out to the zones and the water coming back from the zones, this will try to maintain that 20 degree delta T. Another cool thing here is it'll tell you your wattage. All right, right here, it'll tell you the wattage. And because you have sensors, it'll tell you what the supply temperature is and the return temperatures. A lot of folks say, well, isn't this gonna fight with, with outdoor reset? Not one bit, doesn't care. It, it doesn't care what the water temperature is. It just cares about the difference between what's going out and what's coming back. So it's an important thing to remember. The only thing this thing cares about is the difference between the water temperature going out and the water temperature coming back. Okay, 
the minimum and maximum settings are what makes are, are the key here and you got to understand there's a min and a max max i think we were all we're all good with you know line b here that's the max you can't go faster than line b but also understand line a is the minimum it can't go any slower than that all right it's not going to just go infinitely slower it's just it has to have that floor it has to have that bottom so let's take a look at our system here we had a we were doing um like eight gallons a minute at eight feet ahead so with all of my zones calling it's a much simpler process with all of my zones calling under design conditions on the coldest day of the year with all of my zones calling i'm going to be working at eight gallons a minute at eight foot ahead and this is my performance curve so at full speed we're looking at 59 watts at minimum speed we're at nine watts so this looks like it's probably i'm going to say about 40 watts or thereabouts that's going to be the fastest it'll go now let's say my smallest zone my one smallest zone is three gallons a minute at three feet ahead okay that's my smallest zone so when that one small zone is the only zone calling it's going to be going here it looked maybe about 12 watts as zones open the circulator will go faster as zones close the circulator will go slower so it'll bop up and down between those two points under design conditions on the quote unquote coldest day of the year now as it gets warmer out both of these lines are going to start dropping okay so let's say i'm at uh at, at 75 percent load okay i'm at 75 percent load maybe my operating point is going to be right here so now my fastest is going to be right there at about let's say 30 watts all right and as it gets warmer out that line's going to go just going to drop 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 now this line of course is going to drop 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 as well but it's not going to drop very far because it's going to hit that minimum speed all right so that's again where that asterisk comes from i will tell you this at some point probably at about fit in this example maybe 40 percent load maybe a little bit less what's going to happen is the load is going to be so low is we've got a we're going to have a nine watt fixed speed pump at that point we won't have a 20 degree delta t but the point is we're not going to have a four or five degree delta t either all right so that's the benefit of a delta t pump and here's the other benefit of the delta t pump there is no such thing as a self-sizing pump in this industry i don't care what anybody says but delta t is about as close as we get right it is about as close as we get um someone asked earlier about a zone using a delta t pump as a zone pump um it will vary its speed but you also got to remember you need a it, it, when you start doing flow and head uh real flow and head calculations when we zone pump, you're gonna find, boy, oh boy, a lot of those loads are pretty low. It's not gonna be what we install, it's gonna be what the load really is. Uh, we had a, an instance where a, a gentleman installed four VT2218s on a four zone job on a 1200 square foot ranch. He had 1200, it was 1200 square foot total, and he had four zones, each one zoned by a circulator. None of those circulators ever went beyond minimum speed. Now, that's not a bad thing because he had four nine watt circulators heating his house. That's pretty cool. All right. That's pretty cool. The thing is, he spent an awful lot of money. How are you guys doing? He spent, a, he spent an awful lot of money on four circulators and really didn't get the, the maximum benefit out of it. There is a there, there, there are a couple circulators we have that, you know, would have been a, a, a good bit less expensive that might have done a similar job. OK. It, so I want to make sure we get that that on the table. All right, I'm going to check for questions again. Guys, got any questions out there? All right, Ali says, I might be missing some basic concept, but in order to maintain the delta T, doesn't the pump need to integrate with some kind of a boiler? Yes, if yes, then how is this delta T a function of the pump? Normally, we energize the new boiler if we are not maintaining a desired delta T. Uh, we're going to talk about just uh, residential boilers here for a moment. When, you know, this, is the, this isn't the, the, the boiler circulator. This would be the system circulator or your... Your, your, your delivery circulator, not the boiler circulator per se. Uh, there are people that will use a Delta T pump as a boiler circulator and try to maintain a, the, the, the design for Delta T across the boiler's heat exchanger. And we've seen that work and work very well. We kind of leave that to the boiler manufacturers to say what they want. You're also seeing now a lot of boiler manufacturers um, equipping their boiler controls, especially, especially uh, commercial, like commercial boilers, with a zero to 10 output for the boiler pump. And then we use a circulator like this that takes a zero to 10 input 
as the boiler pump. And now the boiler tells that circulator how fast to go to maintain that delta T across the across the boiler. To me, that's the next frontier for residential boilers. We're already seeing in a lot of like commercial ones. But in, in terms of a delta T application in with the VT2218, I'm talking about the, 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 the circulator that distributes the heat to the system. So let me know, Ali, if that clears things up for you a little bit, okay? Um, that was a very good question, but let me know. If, let me know if that makes sense to you. Is that right? And any more questions, folks? Please just chime on in. That's what we're here for. All righty. Now let's do a deep dive into uh, both both of these circulators. Kind of get a really good idea of what the offerings are like. And here's a look at, at our, our Delta P family. We have the 007, the 0015 E3, and the 0018 E. The 15 E3 and the 7 E are pretty simple and straightforward. Um, the 15 E3, if you like three-speed circulators, you know, your, your simple click, 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 it goes high, medium, you know, low, medium, or high. Hey, you're going to love the 0015 E3 because it, it, what it does is it addresses some of the shortcomings of the three-speed circulator particularly when used in a zone valve application. Additionally, there's a lot of features built into, into our 00 series of variable speed circulators that, that, that are kind of helpful. The bio barrier and sure start we're gonna talk about in a, in a few seconds. Um, basically, the, the, there's two things that kill circulators, right? Let me see, what, what, you guys tell me, what do you think the two things are that kill circulators? All right. Type type in your answers. There. What are the two things that kill circulators? And then we'll start to be. Then we can we can talk a little bit about the bio barrier and the sure the sure start. Lauren, yep. System trash. There you go. Absolutely. That's that's that is it. Starts and stops to a degree, but we're talking about 18 years worth of starts and stops for residential circulators. Cavitation can, but cavitation with cavitation with little little wet rotor residential circulators is actually kind of hard to pull off. Big, you know, the big commercial ones. It's a lot more. It's a lot more common. Happens very, very rarely in residential applications. Black iron oxide, yeah, water quality. That all of those things, all of those things make are, are not terribly good things. Uh, running over its curve, kind of hard for a circulator to do that in a residential application. Um, deadheading, yeah. Although deadheading, it, think about how long a circulator, especially one of these, will have to deadhead for anything bad to happen. We're talking not just weeks, we're talking months. Not to say you should do it, but we've seen circulators deadheading for months that, that, are, that, that work out just fine. But it's not, it's not something you wanna shoot for, I guess if we're saying it. What we're talking about, what kills circulators, yeah, system trash, magnetic crap causing the rotor to lock up and then we burn out the motor, or air trapped in the volute where the circulator's basically pumping against nothing it causes the circulator motor to burn out as well. Both of those are the most common killers of circulators. Both of those are addressed by the bio barrier and especially sure start. And I'm gonna talk about those in a little bit more detail in just a minute, but those, yeah, but, but that's kind of kind of where we're looking at. You got a three color LED, which gives you the uh, indication of what it's doing, orange, red, or white. Uh, we'll explain that in a second. Two way or four way uh, 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 case, bolt casing options. So. To, if, if it's service and you use the, uh, the, the two-way flange, you know, uh, the optional two-way flange, it doesn't matter what the flange configuration is of the pump you're replacing, this thing will fit in with no problem. Um, and the flanges themselves have what's called a nut grabber on them. It's basically a machined, milled out little mini wrench in the flange itself. So instead of when you're installing the circulator, instead of trying to install it with two wrenches and three hands, you can install it with one wrench and two hands. So that, that nut grabber, which is milled, so it, the, the nut fits in there very, very snugly. Uh, we see a lot of them that are, that are cast and it's not quite as snug. This fits in there nice and snug. You can, you can install this thing with just one wrench, which makes life a lot easier. So little things like that that went into these things to help make the installation go a little bit easier. The other thing about this is it's, the motor itself is double insulated. That means that that green plastic casing that you see is injection molded over the motor itself. What does that mean to you? It's a two-wire uh, two uh, circulator. There's no ground wire required with a double insulated motor. So there's no ground, there's no ground screw built into that. So we've made your wiring 33% easier, if you will. So there's no ground required. And the wiring is pretty easy. There's six inch stranded leads connected to a Molex plug. So if you wanted to, you could pull that Molex plug out, do the wiring, wiring connections outside of the box where you have room, 
and then you can put the Molex plug back in and stuff the wire back in. So it's designed for make it to make it easy for you to wire up in tight spaces. Okay, so that's a, again a, a, an advantage, an advantage to the to uh, that thing. And then the I it comes with an IFC, but the IFC is not in the circulator; it's in the box. We asked, we had about a 60-40 split between do you want it installed in the circulator or in the box? We went within the box because that's what the 60% sell. Performance curves. Again, we're talking about performance curves. What do these things do? Well, as we said, it's like three, it's like a three-speed circulator. You have low, medium, and high. Low is five foot ahead. Whoops, excuse me. Low is five foot ahead constant pressure. Medium is 10 foot ahead constant pressure. And then if you go high, I mean, that's what we call contractor no callback mode, right? That's full speed, fixed speed. It's a 44 watt circulator at that point, and it will operate at full speed, fixed speed along this curve. It is no longer a variable speed circulator, but you have low and medium, five foot ahead, constant pressure, 10 foot ahead, constant pressure. Now let's go back to our zone valve job, or I'm, I'm sorry, our zone pump job. If we had a zone pump job, three gallons a minute, and the head was five foot ahead, well, bada bing, bada boom, it's going to work right there. Okay, here's your system curve. It's going to work right there. It's going to give you three to five. It's not going to vary its speed because it's a zone pump, right? There'll be no changes in pressure differential, so there's no reason for it to change. But it'll work right there at three gallons a minute at five foot ahead. Okay? Now, that's under design conditions. When it's October, when it's at April, when maybe my heat load is way down here, it's still going to work at three gallons a minute at five foot ahead. That's what any anybody's circulator is going to any anybody's delta p circulator is going to do just that okay because that's just it's working on that fixed performance curve if i said hey i don't know about the low i'm going to just guess and put it to, to medium because it's in the middle well now i'm at four gallons a minute at 10 foot ahead okay i got 33 percent more flow that means i'm going to have a 25 percent lower delta t not ideal but it's not it's not the worst thing in the world but it's not ideal we could have done better by, by really knowing where we were supposed to set it. And if I said, you know, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I'm going to contract with no callback mode so I can get out of here. I'm going to be close to close to um, five gallons a minute. Now my delta T is really shrinking. All I'm using is less electricity. I'm really not improving the situation any in terms of boiler performance. All righty. Let me know if that makes sense to you, folks. All right. Let me know if that makes sense. And it's similar, the similar thing is uh, when we're looking at a at a zone valve system again in a zone valve application i'll have multiple system curves actually it's going to look just like this i've got multiple system curves as zones close as we showed you earlier it's just going to move that away and use less wattage as zones open it's going to do the opposite okay and we start using lower you know slower and slower system or performance pump curves that use less and less electricity but it's going to stay on that line because it has to. That's the control curve. That's where it's supposed to work. The 007E, now 0015E was introduced for people who love three-speed circulators. The 007E was introduced for people who love 007s. 007 is the is is to re remains the number one selling wet rotor circulator in North America. And it's not by a little, folks, it's by a lot. Still to this day, it's such a it's an industry workforce. As a flat curve pump, it's perfect for zone valve jobs. Uh, what we did with the 007E was simply create a simple, basic ECM circulator. There's no dial, there's no light show, there's no programming. If you use 007s and you like them, use a 007E, you'll like it, and you'll get virtually the same performance uh, with a, you know, while using a lot less electricity. The reason we came out with, with both of these is because when ECM circulators first came out, we kind of surveyed customers and we asked if they were using them and if they were not. And we weren't so much interested in the people, we, we were interested in people that were using them, but we wanted to know why the people who weren't using them weren't using them. And we really wanted to know why. The, what do you think the, answer, the number one answer we got was? When we asked people who were not using ECM circulators why they weren't using ECM circulators, what do you think they told us? Type in your type in your your thoughts there. I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. Yeah, what what do you think they told you? Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Says well, that's a that's a yeah. That's one that's one very common very common uh, response. The most common response, however, was there it is. Zach's got it. Cost. Yeah, them them, them suckers expensive, man. That them suckers expensive. Um, they're very very they they cost more. 
a lot more than a regular 007 or whatever it was they were using. And it wasn't so much, so we just dug a little deeper. Okay, wait, wait a minute, now, why are they too expensive? I mean, they do really cool stuff. Why do you think they're too expensive? And what we learned was this, the first round of variable speed circulators that came out uh, were like our VR1816 and some of the others were multi-feature, multi-function circulators. That means they could do about 14 different things, which is really cool, right? But when you buy a circulator, how many different things do you need it to do? Usually just one, right? So the reason people, one of the reasons people thought they were too expensive, well, they were more expensive, but there's a difference between more expensive and too expensive. The reason people thought they were too expensive is, hey, I'm buying, I, I need this thing to do one thing, right? It does 14. I'm paying for 13 things I'm never going to use. To me, that doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense. And Dan asked, was that the Bumblebee? No, actually, it was not. The Bumblebee was actually a very, had tremendous value because it was a strictly Delta T pump. Um, we're talking about the VR1816, the Grunfuss Alpha, and a few of the others. Multi-feature, multi-function, did a lot of different stuff. We can do 15 different things, and I only need one. You know, I... I'm paying for all these things I'm not going to use. The value wasn't there. Yeah, I love the Bumblebee too, Lauren. That was a great, great circulator. And really, if you look at the VT2218, that think of that as Bumblebee 2.0. All right, that's uh, that's 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 really what what it is. It's Bumblebee 2.0. So very good. But that's the that was one of the reasons that we saw that that there was a, a, a less than universal adoption of ECM technology. So we said, okay, let's think about this. They only, if they like, we sell a lot of 007s. The 007E is, is a logical ECM jump. It, it, yeah, I don't have to learn programming. I don't have to learn what the lights mean. I don't have to learn all this other stuff. It's the same. It's it basically, here's, it's basically the same circulator. Let's take a look at the performance. This is your 007 performance curve, and there's your 007E performance curve. And our own studies have shown most of the applications you're going to run into in residential hydronics are right in there. I mean, if, if you needed 18 gallons a minute at three foot ahead, you know what? The 0070 ain't going to do it. 007 will, but the 0070 won't do it. But that's the that's the big sweet spot right there of the market. And again, we sell so many 007s still do to this day. The 0070 is the perfect ECM uh, next step from, from the 007. I, I want to jump back and, and get back to that sure start and bio barrier because they're very, very important. Uh, as we as we said, the two things that kill circulators are magnetic crap, black iron oxide and stuff like that, that being magnetic, when you start up a circulator, say a standard AC circulator, when you start up a circulator, you got current running through copper wires around, wrapped around hunk of metals. Anybody who got their wolf badge in Cub Scouts know that's how you create an electromagnet, right? You got magnetic crap in the water and you got an electromagnet magnet back here. <laughs> well, there's natural attraction. That would attract, draw that black iron oxide into the rotor of a circulator. And in down times, in off season, that black iron oxide can just seize up, uh, can seize up the, uh, the, the rotor. So it can't move. You get what's called a locked rotor. So that's a problem, right? That when the circulator tries to start up, the rotor can't move, but the motor's saying, move, damn it, move, move, move. But the thing won't move. The circulator gets really, really, really hot. The impeller isn't moving. There's no heat. And ultimately, you get a no heat call. If you're lucky, you get to the job site before, while the circulator motor's still hot. Because if the circulator motor's still hot, you can save the circulator, right? You whack it with something and try and free it up and, and hope for the best. If you get to the job and the circulator's stone cold, that means the motor's burned out. You got to replace the whole thing. Um, so that's what kills circulators from the black iron oxide magnetic crap side. What Sure Start does is it prevents that seize up. All right, the brain of the circulator knows the impeller's supposed to be spinning. It knows that. Well, if the impeller's not spinning and it's supposed to be, the control says something's wrong here. That rotor's seized up. So what it will do? is it'll stop and then it'll start oscillating the impeller back and forth at really high power loads to try to break it free. And it goes, ah, ah, ah. it'll try to break it free. And it'll do that process for up to 20 minutes and up to 100 cycles. Now in the wild, out in the real world, we've seen three, maybe four cycles is what it takes to break that thing free. 
and then continue operating as normal to the point where neither you nor the homeowner ever even knows there's a problem, right? However, if something really nasty gets in there and, and, and seizes that thing up, after 100 cycles and I can't make it go, it's going to say, you know, I don't want to burn this circulator up. I'm going to simply shut down, stop this nonsense of trying to seize it up. My LED is going to turn red, and that's a signal for someone to come take, take a look because there's something stuck in there. It could be solder balls. We've seen sticks. I mean, really weird stuff. It has to be something physically keeping that thing from moving. So think about how much that can save a circulator really how, how you know it saves it saves a needless return a needless service call and actually can prevent a circulator from burning up so that's the short start function we also have an air purge function now this isn't for purging air out of the system you know when you first install it this is for getting air out of the volute right out of this part right here okay if it happens to get airbound for whatever reason if you had a circulator that was like that, you try to do it one of two ways. You might try to loosen a loosen a, a bolt on the flange and maybe burp it, or you might try if you had a valve on the inlet side, you know, you know, closing it and opening it real fast. Boom, 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 boom. Try to blast that air out. What the air purge function is going to do is it's going to emulate that. So what it's going to do is it's going to slow down and then super speed up to beyond its highest speed because it has the capability of doing that with this function slow down and just blast the air out of the volute and it'll continue to do that until the air is out and you'll see that you'll see the led flashing white and then turning red and flashing white and turning red to get it all out of there on top of that we have a a what we call a bio barrier and that's a a brass mesh fine brass mesh it's not a filter because there's no continuous water movement but what that that does is it makes the, the always on magnet, the permanent magnet in the motor of, a, of our ECM circulators, that brass mesh makes, makes those magnets invisible to the black iron oxide on, in the water. So the black iron oxide that's in the water zips it, comes into the volute, it doesn't even know there's a magnet on the other side because brass is not magnetic. So again, it, it, it's a thing that can help save the whole, the whole situation. Okay, real quick again, normal mode is orange mode, white is sure start. And red is a locked rotor. It's a permanent red. It's a, you do have that locked rotor, and that's the signal to come fix it. I want to go over the 0018 very quickly, and then uh, a couple of other things uh, to, to discuss. The 0018 is a Bluetooth-enabled circulator. You don't need to. You don't that, that connects to an app. You don't need to use the app to use the circulator, but the app helps you get the most out of the circulator. So. You can set it up with just one-way communication where the, all the app will do is tell you what, what it's doing and you use the dial to set it up. One part of the dial, if you're zone pumping, you have an infinitely adjustable fixed speed, which is perfect for zone pumps. I can set it to any fixed speed that I want, somewhere, anywhere in that blue range. Uh, I also have uh, uh, the, other, the second section, uh, the ZV section, ZV for zone valves. In this case, I have two constant pressure choices, 15 foot ahead or 10 foot ahead. Limited applications, but I do have those choices. And then I have um, my thermostatic radiator valve proportional pressure selection, again, medium and high speed. And that's just in one way communication. If I were to turn this dial that you see all the way to the left to the Bluetooth insignia, now I initiate two way conversation or two way communication with my app. And now I can use my app to program the circulator to the nth degree. And that gets kind of cool. So we have, you know, four different operating modes. On the left-hand side, you see the orange mode. That's, that's, that's constant pressure delta P. And whereas the dial only has two settings, the app gives me nine different settings. So I have nine different performance curves to select for optimized programming. And how do you program it? How do you change the setting? Well, if you look up at the top, right up, right up here, you see these arrows, uh, left and right. And if I go to the left or right, this this highlighted line will go up or down to tell you which one of the constant pressure lines you've you've selected. Or you can simply use your finger and press one of the lines. If say you want to go down to four foot ahead or three foot ahead, you simply press the line with your finger, and you'll see the line jump, and that's where it'll be programmed as easily as that. Over on the right-hand side, you see the fixed speed setting. Uh, anywhere in that blue wedge, you can set this thing up. And how do you set the speed there? Well, there's a little slider right there that you use your finger with 
and you can move that back and forth from 20% speed up to 100% speed. And then down at the bottom, if you know the flow rate that that zone requires, you just move this slider until you reach that flow rate that you want. It will deal with the head on its own. So you actually, you only need, with this thing, you only need to know the flow. You don't need to know the head. It will, it will work the head out on its own, but it will give you the flow that you set it for, which makes setting it up very, very easy. So if you know you need three gallons a minute, don't bother figuring out the head. Just set this thing up to give you three gallons a minute. Bada bing, bada boom, you're all set and ready to go. Uh, the other two options are over here on the right-hand side. We In the green, we have cons, uh, proportional pressure. And again, same thing, nine different settings. Use your finger to pick the one you want. And then we have our auto setting, our automatic setting. Um, it's called take out active adapt. Uh, but I want to talk about that in a minute too, because a, a lot of people misunderstand what the auto function on anybody's ECM circulator really is. Uh, real quick, I want to show you how to set this thing up for constant speed for a zone pump. Step one, get a load, get an idea of the load. What's the BTU load on that zone? How many BTUs is it? And then using the universal hydronics formula, GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500, figure out what the flow rate is. Once you figure out the flow rate is, move the slider till you find the flow rate. Piece of cake, right? And you can dial that sucker into exactly where it needs to be. We had a really small zone, two gallons a minute at three feet ahead. Think about, it's virtually impossible to get any other circulator down to that level and know that you have it down at that level. With the, uh, with, the, with the app and the slider, you can get it down to two gallons a minute at three feet ahead. For zone valves, it's the same thing, only different. When you wanna set this up for zone valves, the first thing you wanna do is get an idea of the total load, right? That one circulator has to do the, the worst case load, which is all of, the, all of the zones open under design conditions. So it's the total load of the job, but then you wanna you convert that load to flow rate, same as before, but then what you do is you switch to the blue mode. You still, you still don't have to figure out head here. You switch to the blue mode, and you do that simply by tapping the picture on the, on the app. Put Move that slider to the total flow, and it will tell you down at the bottom the head loss that that system has with all zones calling, right? So with all zones calling, move the slider till you get the flow rate you're looking for, read the flow down in the bottom, and just to the right of that, you'll see an indication of the head, all right? If we take a look on the on the app, and way down the bottom here, you see you see flow, right? You see the flow, and right there's the head. So once you know the head, you go back to the orange mode, and then you pick you you put you use your finger and you pick the line that's going to give you that nine or ten foot ahead or wherever we were at. So it's, it it makes it very easy to to set this circulator up in in a in a in an optimized mode without without really without guessing. Okay. Is that right? And then, then you're all set. So a couple of questions here. How does it know that there's air in the pump? Good question, Al. Uh, basically, what, if there's air in that pump, that impeller's spinning against nothing, right? There's no resistance at all. And if it's spinning against no resistance, it says, all right, now this is way out of line. This is not normal. If I'm spinning against nothing, I know I got to be spinning against some kind of pressure. That's when it'll go into that air start mode. That makes sense. Zarite, Zarite, very good, very good. Now I want to talk real quick, and we'll wrap up last few minutes talking about the the auto functions on these on on variable speed circulators. And I and all and the reason I want to go through this is because I've heard so many people say, well, don't you just press that button and it sizes itself and it constantly adapts to changes? Uh, no, <laughs> not even close. None of none of them do that. I don't care who makes it. None of them do that. And I just like this quote because it really it can, to me, it kind of sums up this. It says, the world is not about Batman and Robin fighting the Joker. Things are more complicated than that. And nothing is scarier than people try to find easy answers to complicated questions. Now, understanding auto is not that hard, but you just got to understand it's not magic. It doesn't, the, the, the circulator doesn't size itself. The circulator doesn't do the thinking for you. The circulator doesn't take the thinking out of it. What auto is, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a setup that is used to optimize performance when you have constant circulation and modulating thermostatic radiator valves because it works in the proportional pressure mode, regardless of manufacturer, all right? So let's take a look at this because uh, it's pretty interesting. Again, it goes back to your typical European style system. 
uh, where you had a ModCon boiler with panel radiators. That is the by far the most common system. Usually it's a two pipe system with one pump running 24 seven. They don't really shut it off. It runs 24 seven. And then the TRVs modulate to control flow through each radiator to control relative comfort in each individual room. All right, that's the way it normally runs. If you have a pump in there that's too big or too small, okay? If it's either programmed or just a fixed speed circulator, if it's too big, you're gonna find the TRVs are mostly closed. They spend most of the time being closed and that, and then all of a sudden they all got to open and then they go close again. They spend a lot of time mostly closed, which gives you heat delivery and comfort. If the radiate, if the thermo, if the, I'm sorry, if the circulator is too small, well, then those TRVs are going to be mostly open. And again, inconsistent heat delivery, inconsistent comfort. A good way to, to I'm going to show you a good visual here in a second, but what Active Adapt, Takeo's Active Adapt, and all the other automatic functions do is they assess changing pressure differentials as the TRVs modulate. That's their job, and it takes time to do this. Then it'll determine the best proportional delta P curve that it can, and if there are any changes, it can move that delta P curve down or up, one, you know, move it one down, move it one up, perhaps. That's what it does. The visual is to think of a football field, and you want what we're trying to do is shrink the field so we're playing the game in between the hash marks as opposed sideline to sideline all right here's a here's a here's a visual for you okay if this middle line is comfort if if you know if the the circulator's too big you're spending a lot of time over here before you move over here and most of your time spent over here if the circulator's too small you're over here most of the time and then you're over here and then you're back there and your delivery is kind of inconsistent what the auto function is trying to do is get just playing in between the hash marks, shrink the field a little bit, so we never waver too far away from that middle comfort line, if that makes sense. That's what it's trying to do in a visual nutshell. What does it all mean? Well, the first time you turn this thing on in the auto mode, it's gonna work on a default setting, okay? That's the factory default. First time it's on, that's where it's gonna work, all right? And it's got to run for at least 90 minutes with the system up, running, and heated. It's got to run for 90 minutes uh, in the winter time for these to, to, to kind of analyze the system. What's going on out there? All right. And then it needs to run another 30 minutes to wait for the system to stabilize and the comfort levels to be achieved by these modulating thermostatic radiator valves. You turn this on in the summer and the TRVs are all closed. It doesn't know what to do, right? It's got to run with the heat on and calling for at least two hours before it figure out, figures out anything. Once those two hours are up, then the algorithms can start to kick in. And here's what the algorithms do, all right? The algorithms are pretty simple, uh, is if I'm operating, let's say at the low end here, if I'm operating at the low end, that means the TRVs are mostly closed, it's kind of warm out, that sort of thing. In order for this thing to adapt, to move, let's say down one, it needs to see a 1.3 gallons per minute flow change for at least 20 minutes. So I need to see when I'm way down here, it's going to need to see the flow go down. I'm going to need a lower flow of at least 1.3 gallons a minute for at least 20 minutes up to 60 minutes if it's a stable load, right? If it's a stable load, it needs to see that it's longer term before it does anything. Then if it, if it does see that, then we'll drop down a line and we'll start working on this performance curve. Now, if I'm way up here and I see a 1.3 gallons per minute increase for that amount of time, then it'll jump up here. Otherwise, we're just gonna be bopping up and down this one specific line as, as the TRVs are opening or closing, as they're modulating more open than closed. So that's kind of what makes it adapt. That's what's happening, okay? And it'll only go up or down if I see that for that. That's the only way it'll go up or down, okay? So it's not sizing itself. It's not automatically adjusting to any minute change. It has to see a considerable change for a considerable amount of time, okay? Now, again, how does it feel? We talked about this before. It interprets resistance against the impeller. As the TRVs are opening, it sees that as an increasing load. 
So that's less resistance. That's a signal for the circulator to speed up. As the TRVs close, that's a decreasing load. It's in, the impeller spinning against more resistance, and that's a signal to slow down. So really, in steady state operation, this is what we're looking for. Continuous pump circulation with that, with you know, jumping back and forth between two lines. That's really what's going to happen. We kill power to the pump. We start all over again. At best, at best, it's going to when 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 the pump turns back on, it's going to start up where it left off. All right, that's what that's the best thing that's going to happen. As far as you know, in a normal zone valve application, when when you know we've got enough heat, we shut everything down. But we're basically starting from scratch again. All right. So again, just understand, you don't press the button and everything figures it out for yourself. What we want is this, okay? What we want is that. Now, real quick, just to wrap up, I wanna show you what this looks like in a zone valve system. So let's say I have a zone valve system and my requirement is seven gallons a minute at seven foot ahead. Here's my default. This, this thick pink line is my default out of the box. We set this thing up, instead of working here, it's going to work right there at, a, at what looks to be roughly, let's move this out of the way, at roughly nine gallons a minute at roughly uh, 10, roughly 10 foot ahead. Okay. That's a little, that's, I'm over pumping. It's a little more flow than I'm looking for, but that's where it's going to work. All right. My one smallest zone, let's look at my one smallest zone uh, or my highest head zone. Let's look at my highest head zone is going to be three gallons a minute at seven foot ahead. That's where it wants to run. In reality, it's going to be running up here. Not, not oversized, not horrible, but that's where it's going to be running. All right. And my smallest zone, my lowest head zone, let's say it's two gallons a minute at two feet ahead. Here's where here's where it gets hinky. All right. If we follow the system curve out, it's actually going to work up here, you know. But what's going to happen as these zones open, I'm going to go up here. As the zones close, I'm going to come back down there. That's just how it works. All right. When this, when we shut off, we're going to start where we left off again. It's going to be working somewhere on the default pump curve. Zones. People look at it and say, well, you know, the zone closes, it goes slower. The zones open, it goes faster. It's working. Yeah, but is it doing? Is it automatically adapting to continuous changes in the system? It's 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 not. Okay, it's not. It's simply doing what it knows how to do. All right. If we do it in a zone pump system, let's say I got a zone that needs three gallons a minute at five foot ahead, it's gonna work there. That's where the system curve intersects the pump curve and it's gonna work there forever. Nothing will ever change. It'll work, it'll heat the room, it'll heat the house. I won't be using 85 watts, I'll be using something less, uh, but it'll never, it'll never change. It's not gonna automatically figure out where it needs to be. It's going to work where the system curve intersects the pump curve and that is that is that. Okay, it's just the way, that's just how they work. So I'm hopeful that this helped you out. It's not ever going to adapt. I'm hopeful this helps you out. Uh, time to open up for general questions, okay? Um, and uh, any anything you might want to know about this this circulator, these types of systems, um, act, you know, the adapt type of systems, the automatic systems, uh, or control modes, or anything else. Time to open it up for 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 general questions for y'all. Oh, wait a minute. I just do want to show you this real quick. If we had that same zone valve job in a delta T with a delta T pump. Or I'm sorry, as a zone pump with a delta T pump, three gallons a minute, five foot ahead, it will, it because it's watching for the delta T is under design conditions, under design conditions, it's going to go right there. It'll give you three gallons a minute at five foot ahead. If you set this thing up and start it running when it's when you're much less than design conditions, what you're going to find is a fixed speed nine watt pump. It's not going to go any faster because it doesn't need to go any faster. We've had a lot of people who install these things they the zone valves if it's on a zone valve system it'll open you know, they'll open and close but the pump's not doing anything but it happens to be you know 55 or 60 degrees outside it's going to it's 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 doing what it can do because again these circulators we call them smart pumps they're not that smart they do what we tell them to do and that's pretty much it so it doesn't replace you you are the you and your knowledge your understanding of how to best apply these things is the key to making no matter who's you, whose pump you use, to your knowledge and understanding of how it operates is the key to making sure these you get the most out of these circulators. Otherwise, you've got a circulator that can do a lot of stuff, but it's not. What you're left is really just a circulator that's using less electricity, and that's about it. 
And to me, that's the that's not a that's not getting the maximum value both for you, most importantly for your customer. Your customer's not getting the maximum value out of this thing. It's a it, the circulator has a potential to help the entire system work more efficiently, but left to its own devices, it's only going to use less electricity. The more you know about how to make these things work, the greater benefit those systems are going to see, and the greater benefits your customers your customers are going to see out of it. So. Let me know what you have for questions there, folks. All right. Oh, one last thing. Yep. Yeah, same thing here. If I wanted to set this thing up to three gallons, five, three gallons a minute to five foot ahead, just moving the dial, I can do that. All righty. And ditto for the uh, ditto for the 0070. It's going to work up here. Is that right? That's it. Let's open it up. Anything you want? Anything you want to know about the the uh, triple E show? Or any other questions you folks might have? Let's uh, let's open it up for you guys. What's the payback on these pumps? Asked Bill O'Donnell. Great question. The only way this thing's going to pay you back, Bill, is if it gets a part-time job. Okay. <laughs> that's a that's a, I, I'm sorry. That's a glib answer. Um, you know, what you're looking at, Bill, is offset, right? That's the term I think you're thinking about. At what point will whatever I pay more for this circulator than a standard circulator? At what point will, and I'm just going to stick to electricity because there's a lot more to it than that. At what point will that offset, uh, the electricity I save, offset the added cost? Actually, there are math formulas for that. And in our next take next residential focus take Tuesday, I think we're going to address that. Uh, the Hydraulic Institute has actually started to, uh, the member manufacturers for the Hydraulic Institute are putting uh, efficiency labels on the circulators and take makes the most efficient circulators in the market of the six highest rated circulators that and the, and the top six are like well ahead of the rest of the industry in terms of electrical efficiency of the six highest rated five of them are take up okay no the six highest rated five of them are take up the, the other one is an armstrong so what does that mean? There's math formulas involved that can, can tell you the estimated electrical consumption. What we're seeing is in most applications, it's 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 anywhere from a year and a half to two to three years, depending. And that's just electrical consumption. Uh, again, it, and it's going to depend on what you pay for electricity. If you're in areas where electricity is still five or six cents a kilowatt hour, OK, it might be a little bit longer. Um, the way I think of looking at it, however, is. I'm not pulling out perfectly good AC circulators to replace them with these. That, that makes no sense whatsoever. I'm looking at it. Say you're, you're replacing a boiler and you're making a decision. Am I going to put in ECM circulators or am I going to put in standard efficiency circulators? At that point, now you've got to start to think about what else is going on here. All right. Is it just the electrical payback I'm looking at? Or am I looking at this, this, this these circulators helping to mitigate potential short cycling, being sized more appropriately for the application so I make sure not only does the system run efficiently, but I don't wear out moving parts on the on the boiler that can actually turn into very expensive uh, uh, service calls later on if I have to replace a blower motor or an ignition module or something like that, right? If I'm not over pumping the system, I'm gonna have greater comfort, greater fuel efficiency and greater system lifespan. So those are the questions you might wanna ask. And in terms of how much more expensive are they, in terms of, Pricing, it, it, 50 bucks, 100 bucks more? Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe, yeah. You need to convert this to the number of old dinosaurs saved. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, there's there's another way of looking at that one too, I'm telling you. Yeah, it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's, there's a lot to it. The simplest is electrical efficiency. Everything else on top of that is like ice cream. But I look at I look at, at, at electrical savings in terms of the, if you were to look at the at, at the benefits of an ECM circulator as a parfait, and as, to, to to quote Donkey and Trek, I don't know of nobody don't like no parfait, right? Everybody likes a parfait. If I were to convert this whole uh, uh, benefit package to a parfait, the uh, the electrical savings is the cherry on top of the parfait. There's a lot more involved in there, but the electrical savings is the cherry on top. So that's the way I would look at it. Um, but yet we, we've done the math. We've worked the math out. And really, it's, 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 it's a year and a half to three years max in terms of offsetting the additional cost if you're in a non-rebate state. Now, in, in New England and in parts of the East Coast, there are, there are the, the electric companies, the energy companies offer 
pretty substantial rebates on these things to get to the point where the cost of one of these is actually less than an AC circulator, because what they're trying to do is they know a lot of circulators go out there. If we, you know, they're buying, what they're doing is they're buying energy efficiency. They're buying lower energy consumption so they don't have to grow their power grid as fast. So that's kind of the way to look at it. So hopefully that helps you, Bill. But yeah, how many old dinosaurs do we save? I like that. I like that. Eugene, thank you so much. Thank you for the kind words. I'm glad it was useful to you. Uh, let me know, guys, was this useful information for you? Was this helpful? Um, and any questions you might have, we'll open it up because basically there's a trade show going on. A lot of people wandering by. Say hello. Hey, here's what I want to do. Let's try this. Let's take a walk around and see the rest of the uh, rest of the uh, the booth. All right. So in back of me here, you're seeing just uh, this is just some some placards. But let's go on over here and we're going to show you some stuff. And there's a, there's a, there's a show goer. Say hi to the hi to the free world. There you go. Excuse me. Go over here. We see just some of some of our products uh, on display. We have um, our fast fill pressure pressure relief valves. We have uh, zone valves and mixing valves. Right there, you see our magnetic dirt separator, the 4900 magnetic dirt separator. We have uh, 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 Pro Press uh, isolation flanges, and then over here you will see our ECM display with all of our circulators and zone valves. And you be able to take a look if you were here, you'd see the uh, the um, 0018E in action with the with the app. So we have all this stuff here. We have some of our plumbing products on display as well. Our 006E3 with our leak breaker uh, leak detection system. 006E3 is our domestic hot water recirculation pump. And uh, we can see the rest of the show. All right, so that's pretty cool. Some big old oil trucks in town. Uh, oh. There's a look at the double at the uh, triple E Eastern Energy Exposition. So cool. All right, let's see what you got for questions here, folks. Where is that heat pump unit? Now the heat pump unit is on the water. We, we believe it's on the water. You should be seeing it hopefully by early uh, early to mid fall, early to mid fall. So uh, we're we're pretty excited about the heat pump unit. We're gonna start. Uh, we're going to start doing some uh, some trainings for our reps and for interested customers. Uh, I'd say end of June, beginning of July. Uh, where are you at, Adam? You know, maybe we can uh, we can uh, make sure we get we hit your area um, uh, for some training because it's going to be an interesting. Uh, it's going to be a really really interesting um, pro product for us. Okay. Uh, let's see, can, uh, Alice. Can you rotate the motor on it on if you're uh, if you're talking about the double OEs, yes, you absolutely can rotate the motor. Uh, it's just four bolts, all right? Now, what you do is you don't take it out because the, the tolerances, these things are so tightly machined for, for, for sound purposes and vibration. They're so tightly machined that if you take it out, twist it and try to put it back in, you might pinch the O-ring and you don't want to do that. What you want to do, once you've undone, un, un, undone or unconnected the four, uh, the four bolts, just simply rotate it in place. All right, that's probably the best way to do it. Rotate it in place till you get the position you want and then put the four bolts back in. Now on the, the 00, uh, 0026 and the 0034s, it's a little bit easier in that this cover is connected to the circulator with a ribbon cord. So really all you do is you take, the, take these bolts out, you just this black, this black piece comes off and you can rotate it to whatever position you need and leave the pump in place. You're not, taking, you're not disconnecting the motor or anything, so it makes it a lot easier. Let me know if that if that helps you, Al. Uh, uh, will we be on tonight? Yes, absolutely, Lauren. I'm gonna be so I'm gonna be flying solo again tonight because Dave Dave is the big honcho here at the at, at OESP, the Oil and Energy Service Providers. Walking around this show with Dave is like walking around with Paul McCartney. I'm telling you, he knows everybody. Everybody loves him. Dave's right here. You walk around this show with Dave, it's like walking around with Paul McCartney. I'm serious. Say hi to everybody, Dave. There he is. Hey, everybody. <laughs> He is he is like the celebrity. He's got it, he's got group he's got groupies, man. They follow him around everywhere. It's crazy. It, it, so so he won't be with us tonight because obviously he's got better things to do, right? Uh, to be you know to, when you're Paul McCartney, you don't have to do the late show. Let's just put it that way. So I'm going to be doing the late show tonight. Um, so that'll that'll be a lot of fun. So yes, we're definitely definitely on tonight. Yeah, Dave gives out stickers. That's true. That's why people like Dave. Dave gives out stickers. That's why people like you. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, Duluth, Minnesota. Boy, I'm not sure we're going to hit Duluth right away. I got to be honest, because you know 
we've got that minus seven degree or minus five degree limit, Adam. So I'm not sure. Well, we, we, we can talk. If there are applications up there, man, you got a nice tight net zero home. We can certainly talk. We can certainly talk. Uh, Carrie asks, are you thinking of a unit similar to the warm floors, complete unit for floors, but uses a boiler instead of a heat pump? Not really. Not at this point. Carrie, that's a good question. Uh, we want to get this. We want to get this heat pump off the floor first. Uh, but an indoor unit like that, if you're thinking like a, an indoor unit that can be used with just a boiler, that's an interesting idea. We, you know, that goes back actually, really good question, a, a, a conversation point. Uh, when Dave and I and several other people work at, here at, at Takeo were at Upanor, we came out with pro panels, which was a, basically it was a boiler room in a box, right? Boiler room in a box, hang it on the wall, connect your boiler, saves a ton of time. People hated the idea absolutely hated the idea i can build that for less no you can't <laughs> if you could you might try parts yeah parts and labor probably not okay but the other thing is even if you could build it for about the same or even a little less you're building it in you're, you're getting your whole thing installed the whole boiler room thing is installed in 15 minutes as opposed to a full day and we're giving you more time to do more stuff that's kind of the 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 point behind the heat pump it's a it's an integrated package indoor unit and outdoor unit you could build everything in the indoor unit but it would take you four days here the whole installation might be done in a day and a half or two and with, with the way the world is now two days getting two free days like that is really act is, is worth its weight in gold so that's kind of the point behind that but that, if, if the world's ready for something like that for a boiler i think that's kind of a cool idea too carrie it's not a bad idea at all uh, we're going to do training at APR Supply in Lebanon. I hope so. I hope so. Ronald, if we can get down there, we'd love to. We, that's a that's a that's that's kind of one of the target areas as well. All right. Terrific, folks. We got 60, 69 of you left. What what other questions do you have? Or anything, anything, anything else you want to see here at the show? <laughs> I suppose I could go wandering around. Yeah, you, yep. Yep. Eugene, you're right. Time is money and solving problems is bigger money. That's the that's the point behind the heat pump. It's the, the heat pump. Uh, system that we're offering system in is that it, it time and money are interchangeable i absolutely believe time and money are interchangeable you can always save more of one by spending more of the other you want to save time spend more money you want to spend save money spend more time they're they're interchangeable uh, the point is can if the installed cost is pretty damn close to the same thing getting it done in two hours is about two days as opposed to four days your profit for per man hour goes way the heck up and you get two days, you know, you get two days to do something else and, and two days is uh, worth an awful lot of money. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, folks, one last call for questions. Love having, love having everybody hanging out. Cause again, this, this is generally my favorite part of the presentation when we can just shoot the breeze and you guys ask questions and all that. Um, so that's, uh, that's whatever, what this is, this is my favorite time. So ask as many questions as you want. I'll stay on as long as you guys have questions. I must have missed you talking about your heat pump. Can you briefly explain the product? Yeah, um, it's called the System M and it's an outdoor air to water heat pump unit. It's an outdoor unit with an indoor companion piece. So all of the things you would need to install an air to water heat pump inside the house, your buffer tank, your circulators, all of your piping, expansion tank, air elimination, plus all of the wiring and the control to run the whole thing we have that built in a box for you, okay? You just plop it on the ground, all right? You put the uh, the, the air to water heat pump outside, all right? It's a it's a it's it's a it's a monoblock system, which means all of the refrigerant is already installed and it's in the unit itself, okay? You don't have to run any refrigerant lines. You just run hot water. You just run a supply and return water line with with uh, with glycol. To connect the outdoor unit to the indoor unit as long as well as a cat 5 line so, so the two will communicate and then you have six pipe connections inside two for two for the outdoor unit two for your heating and cooling and two for your indirect and we offer we offer a high performing indirect as well and uh, the, the control runs everything automatically there's an immersion heater built into the buffer tank to boost the capacity as it starts to get colder out and it turns on automatically uh, the control strategy, the control package is really the key to this whole thing because it makes it all work seamlessly. You don't have, it, it's designed to work together and designed to work with either an A coil for forced air heating and cooling, or you could just use an A coil for cooling, and then you could have low temperature hydronics for heating, or you could have both 
hot forced air heating and low temperature hydronics for heating in, 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 in depending upon what the application is so you could do you could do a myriad of different things with it so that's the that's the that's the brief explanation dan i hope that helps boy oh boy there's going to be a lot more to it than that but that's just gives you the uh that just gives you the uh the the the, the 20,000 or 30,000 foot view adam s is the outdoor loop isolated from the indoor side um the outdoor you, you've got the the refrigeration loop and that's all outside and there's a heat exchanger and on uh, one side of the heat exchanger is the refrigerant and then the other side of the heat exchanger is the water that's pipes to the inside so you do need to insulate your lines and you do need you do need to like you do need to like call those lines it was a choice of running having a split system or a monoblock system in the split system you'd have to run refrigerant indoors we chose to go with the split system keep the refrigerant outdoors and just run water, you know, your, your heated water lines to, from outdoors to indoors, that opens up some length for us. You can go up to 100 plus feet away. You don't, you're not limited by how far away the outdoor unit is from the indoor unit. Gives you a little bit more flexibility that way, which we which we found to be of, of greater value. Let, let me know if that answers your question. Is it inverter compressor design? Absolutely, yes, yes. So it'll work very efficiently at low temperatures. Uh, we're good to about five to seven below. We can still extract heat out of out of air temperature. I think five to seven below. Not a lot, but we can do it. <laughs> uh, and then that's when that's when the uh, uh, immersion heater, uh, the electric immersion heater, kicks in and and helps us to get to where we might need to be. Uh, really, we're looking at net zero homes to start. Real low energy homes uh, for both heating and cooling loads. Um, you know, the houses that are designed to run with as little fossil fuel as possible. Uh, so they're very, the, but, the envelopes are buttoned up really, really tight, both for heating and for cooling. So that's kind of where we're, where we're looking at there. All right. Terrific, folks. More questions. Keep them coming. I'm here. I'm sitting here talking to myself at the Eastern Energy Expo. And the, the, I got to tell you, the booth, the booth's been pretty busy. Kind of non-stop since the show opened, which is always a great sign because uh, you know, Taco is a great, great supporter of the uh, Eastern Energy Expo and of the oil heat, uh, oil, oil and energy service providers group. Uh, long time, long time benefactor of that organization. And um, you know, this is just one of our favorite shows of the year because it's a small group, but it's a group that's really, really into what they're doing. Uh, they've, they, each day of the show, they would have, they, they like had educational web seminars all morning. Uh, on business and on technical. And then tomorrow they're gonna have a full morning of business and technical uh, presentations as well. And it's designed so that the, 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 they, they don't overlap with the trade show. A lot of times, a lot of trade shows will have them overlapping and you gotta decide, do I wanna go to the trade show? I wanna go to class? <laughs> Here they make sure they don't overlap so you can go to both if you want to. And it's at the Mohegan Sun Casino, which is all kinds of fun. Uh, I, I am not a gambler, so I didn't lose any money, but then again, I didn't win any money either. Usually when I go into a casino, I just, the first person I see, I hand them a $20 bill and say, that's it, better you than them, and I'm done. Because it's quicker that way, and it's more painless. <laughs> All right, folks, if there are no more questions, I'm going to say thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, but again, if you have questions, type them in, because like I said, I'll stay on as long as you want. But uh, if we're done, we're done. And uh, I appreciate the gift of your time. Thank you so much for being with us. It's always a joy and uh really really have fun with you folks and uh, we appreciate uh, you being with us on Taco tuesday uh next week will be a commercial uh application and then uh, we're going to end up end up uh uh june with uh we will be talking about the hydraulics institute efficiency ratings on on residential circulate so you won't want to miss that that'll be really important and a lot of fun Alrighty, folks thank you so much have a wonderful rest of your week and uh enjoy the warm weather in the springtime and we'll see you soon take care everybody